Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel, I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today we're jumping into some Tales from Tech Support. Please check out the KCC Discord linked in the description down below. There you can talk to me and a whole bunch of KCC fans who hang out there on a regular basis. I look forward to seeing you there. Our first story today comes to us from, yes please mate, IT is a thankless job until it isn't. Let's jump right in. Since there was a post detailing sweet experiences with users appreciating work done, I felt I should add to that simply because we really don't see enough of it. As I've said before, I work for a fairly large school district as an L1 campus tech. Because of how large our district is, somewhere around high teens and campuses, swiftly growing, we don't have enough techs at the moment to give everyone a single campus. The high schools and middle schools have enough problems on their own that they require a single dedicated tech on campus every day. The elementary campuses do not have close to the numbers that the above do, so techs will get assigned multiple campuses to take care of throughout the week. I recently was given my third campus to oversee, which just so happened to be the week after the spring break, which came after two weeks of delays due to weather and state testing. So when I say I was backed up on tickets due to being unable to work on them, I'm saying my open ticket numbers were almost starting to rival that of one of the middle schools. The week this story describes was my catch-up week. From the moment I walked in the door to about two hours past lunch, my feet were in constant motion from classroom to classroom. This campus in particular was extra unlucky, as my day to visit them happened to be the days that we froze over and school was cancelled. So needless to say, they were really hurting for tech help, and I was really hurting to get my numbers down to a point that I no longer feel pain when seeing them. It was around 10am on this midweek day, and I had closed well over a dozen tickets by this time. Most of which were your standard issues, my projector doesn't turn on, or my student's Chromebook won't turn on, or even Suzy Q dropped her Chromebook and now the screen is coming off. I was in a daze and entirely functioning on autopilot. My attention was shot, smiles were faked, and conversations were very brief because I was truly exhausted from all the work the week had brought me. This next ticket in my queue talked about a student having an issue with a testing app, stating it was taking much longer than normal to load. No big deal, let me swing by and check it out. When I stop by, I find the kid and ask him to show me what was going on. I immediately learned this kid was very smart when it came to figuring things out simply because he power cycled the Chromebook using the key combo refresh plus power and I'm still teaching the teachers how to do that. He shows me the app and how it's not loading properly so I take the Chromebook and head back to my office. The best thing about these Chromebooks is you can just hook it up to the network and power wash it to reset it. It's like five button presses and about a minute or two at most. Typically this solves 75% of the issues I come across, and I was hopeful that this was simply something that could be solved by it. So I reset it and tested the app again, since the machine is set to have the app installed based on the profile defined by the network. I boot the app up and, sure enough, near instant response. Well, cool, job done, on to the next one. I bring the kid his Chromebook after at most three minutes, and they're shocked to see me so quickly. I explain what I did and ask the student to test if all is working, to which I get a happy confirmation. All is good, I leave to work on the next. You might be wondering where the happy part of this story comes, well here it is. On the way out for lunch, I'm on fumes at best. As I'm approaching the door, the teacher of that previous student passes me and goes, hey, my kids think you're a wizard. That student was convinced he wouldn't have his Chromebook back for a while, and I told him that you were really good at your job and that you get things done really fast. Thank you so much for all your help. I belt out the most animated laugh I've had all week and tell her that I'm always happy to help. It's these small things in life that make it all worth it, really. I did end up getting my ticket numbers down after that week, but honestly, I wouldn't have gotten it done as quickly without that interaction. I honestly can't imagine what it's like to be an IT tech for schools because kids are dumb and they think they can fix things themselves and end up messing things up even further than they were before. I would not want to spend my days fixing those problems. It is quite possible based on that one interaction though that that student might think about going into an IT career now. 
do me a quick favor and take a look down below the video. If that subscribe button's still red, it means you're actually not subscribed to the KCC channel. Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. This next story comes to us from DWM 1978. Stupid boss cripples Navy ship's connectivity. Let's jump right in. A little more than a decade ago when I was still active duty US Navy, we were on a deployment and at that point sailing in the Mediterranean Sea. One of my technicians was working on the main interface between the ship's internal networks and the satellite. Everything went through this system. Internet, email, message traffic, ship to shore phones, secure networks, etc. We had been having a minor connection issue with the shore facility. Boss tells my tech to enter a change into the configs. No change. Boss tells him to enter a different change. Without undoing the first, no change. This goes on for about 30 minutes or so. Then I hear this. Change that to this, then restart. I have to copy the running config over to the startup first. Should take a minute or two. I know how this system works. I went to school for it, just restart it. Note, he went to the school for two versions ago. Different OS. Didn't work the same anymore. One of the commands he had the tech enter had cleared the startup config file during the last 30 minutes. If we just restart, we'll lose every config in the system, and a reload will take a lot longer. Just do what I tell you to do. Bigger Boss needs to get messages out for our next port visit. Note, I had talked to Bigger Boss earlier in the day. He was glad to not have a ton of emails coming in and couldn't care less. Just let me copy this and I'll restart. Just get out of my way and I'll do it. Tech walked over to me and said we had better open the safe and get the backup configs ready. We entered our combos in the safe and pulled the disk. I looked at the sleeve and the date of the last backup was after we left home port. No big deal. What the F? I can't get into anything now. We walk over disk in hand and get ready to reload everything. Pop the disk in, pull up the file just to visually verify everything and the file has only the header, nothing else. I ask boss who according to the log did the last backup if he had verified the file before he burnt the disk. It's an easy process and he usually always took the easy ones because boss, what the F do you think I am an idiot? Of course I did, everything was there. Nothing is there now. Tech, pull the older disk out and we'll try to rebuild from there. Tech looked confused. There isn't an older one. There has to be. We keep two for just this reason. It's not here, man. Take a look. I go through every disk in the binder. He's right. It's gone. I shredded it. We only need the most current. You what? Tech, hand me the sat phone. I'll be up on deck for a bit. Because boss wanted to save the ginormous amount of space that a single CD takes up, we were completely disconnected with an empty box of a router. It took me over two hours of drop sat calls to a few civilian techs I knew to get a new config made and sent out via regular mail. Two weeks later, we got the disk in hand and had the system restored in about an hour. Boss was ordered by Bigger Boss to not touch that system again while stationed on board. This is but one of many tales from USN tech support. And yes, users are just as stupid, if not more so sometimes. I don't think there's a more dangerous person in the world besides a boss in a military position who thinks he knows better than the specialists under his authority. Honestly though, the best way to handle that kind of person when they come to you and say, just do it my way, is to say, okay, it's your funeral. This next story comes to us from Viper30,000. Let's chat about your repair, shall we? Let's jump right in. One of the banes of every TV repairman's existence is the amateur. There was a survey done while I was in the business that stated that TV repairmen were the second least trusted professionals, just ahead of used car salesmen, and I can understand why. In any business that requires specialized knowledge, there are always those jerks that use their knowledge to cheat people. My boss didn't stand for that, however, believing, correctly, that it would be far more profitable to simply make sure your customers knew they could trust you. Still, the stigma led many to try to fix their sets themselves, or call the expert friend who would come over, happy to share his vast knowledge to the wonderment of all. Usually, in the very early days, that vast knowledge consisted of taking tubes to the local drugstore to the U-Testum tube tester. Tubes sold here in an attempt to find the bad one. 
What they didn't know was that the tester in the drugstore was a bit schizophrenic. If it told you the tube was bad, it was bad. But if it told you the tube was good, well, it might be lying to you. With the advent of solid state electronics and transistorized circuits, a lot of this fell by the wayside. But there was always the guy who thought they could save some money by trying to fix it themselves. Doing so could be compared to do-it-yourself dentistry. You might get lucky, but more than likely, you're not going to like the results. There was, however, one part that even the most unknowledgeable amateur always felt sure they could replace with impunity, a fuse. Now, let's start with one important concept. Fuses generally don't go bad. The number of times I've heard, it's a bad fuse, from the uninitiated could, if transformed to dimes, buy me an unending supply of overpriced coffee. When any other part stops working, it might be bad. When a fuse blows, it's not going bad, it's working as designed, protecting the circuit behind it from an overvoltage or current situation that would ruin far more expensive circuitry and render the set well and truly dead. You can replace a fuse with the exact replacement maybe once, but if it still blows, you need to get your equipment to a pro. Trying too many times can result in acrid smells accompanied by smoke and cracking sounds. This is considered a bad thing. Still, there is always that one guy who is sure he knows better. Which brings us to the guy who brought in a small portable color TV. He was really annoying and unreasonable, demanding, talking down to me and my colleagues, expecting special treatment and super quick turnaround, just being an entitled jerk. It was good to watch him walk out the door. I put it on my section of the bench and began taking the back off. The set was one of the well and truly dead. And when I opened it up, I found that the entire power supply and horizontal output section were burnt to a crisp. Normally in this model, there would be a fuse to protect all of this, but upon looking, I found that the user had attempted his own fix by wrapping the fuse in tinfoil. With no fuse to protect them, this caused the set to do its best imitation of an Independence Day barbecue, complete with the aforementioned smoke and acrid smell. The protected circuits were very literally toast. As I have insinuated thus far, the first commandment of retail electronics is, thou shalt have no other technicians before me, and for this very reason. It was not going to be cheap to put his set back together. He was not happy with the price and made a number of disparaging comments over the phone when we called in his estimate, but he really had no choice and agreed to the repair. Finally, the day came for him to pick it up, and I happened to be on the counter when he came in. He was loudly complaining about the price just to replace a few parts the whole time I was retrieving his set. By the time I set it on the counter, my patience was gone. I had resurrected his TV from the dead, and he was complaining. My mischievous side came out. I leaned over the counter and started speaking conspiratorially. Hey, I noticed you had someone else work on it before we got it. I would be very careful and not go to that guy again. Do you know what he did? He wrapped a fuse in tinfoil. That's what caused the damage. Can you imagine anyone being that stupid? I can't imagine what he was thinking. I was laying it on heavy, pretty much calling him every word for foolish in the book, and all he could do was stand there, listen, and nod. There was no way he was going to fess up and admit that he was the guy with the tinfoil. I finished my comments with a smile. He was silent as he quickly paid and left the shop as fast as he could. It was always rare when I could feel like I'd managed to get a little of my own back, and I have to admit that it was a high point of my week. I've got to be honest, I'm not an electrician, and so I never really thought of it that way myself. But I think from now on, I'm going to correct myself and not call it a bad fuse. It's a blown fuse. Learn something new every day. Gotta be honest though, tinfoil doesn't really sound all that bad, because I've definitely heard stories in the past of people using bullets in the place of a fuse. And of course, I just need to add in a quick disclaimer here that if you put in tinfoil or a bullet into your fuse panel, I take absolutely no responsibility. You are a complete moron and shouldn't be allowed to ever touch anything electronic again. This next story comes to us from Happy Dutchman. We urgently need you to restore this file. Let's jump right in. Another story reminded me of this experience. I think it was about 1996, 
and I had a side job as general IT support at a nearby local government office. Long time ago, so I'll enhance the forgotten details. The main IT strategy whenever they needed a new computer for anyone was to go to the local computer store and buy whatever was discounted that day. About 120 or so computers, almost all different and standalone. And an AS400 with about 40 terminals connected. Each user had their own backup routine explained to them. Some did this, but most didn't. One day, management decided they needed upgrading and a network with file server, etc. In comes a big IT company and installs 25 new computers for management and their support staff, including a room of typists. I get the task to replace the backup tapes on the two days I am around. I noticed that the tape wasn't ejected automatically and has to be ejected manually. This worried me, as all other backup tape drives I had seen prior would do this. I looked for logs on the server but found none. I even didn't see any jobs scheduled. I contacted Big IT Company about this, and their answer was, of course you can't see the jobs and logs, as they run with special permission. I argued about me logging in with the domain administrator account, but they ignored me. One day, I received a call from the legal person requesting a restore of a document they created a few days ago, but was deleted accidentally by themselves just now. They of course always did their backup before being migrated to one of the new computers, they urgently need the restore as the document needs to be sent via registered mail today, and it is 2 p.m. I contact Big IT Company as I had no information on how to perform restores. They walk me through opening the backup software and indicate me to select last night's backup. I reply that the screen is empty. They don't understand. I fill them in on our earlier exchange from several months prior with their coworker and the special permission, etc. You get it, I was right all along. They still ask me to manually index the last tape, but dice. I walk over to the legal person. It is now an hour later and they have phoned me twice already and explain that we don't have a backup because it was never implemented. They exclaim that this can't be true and that we will face legal implications if we don't restore the file. We go back and forth a bit until they say the magic words. If we don't have this letter at the receiving end, by the end of day tomorrow, we have a huge problem. They are pointing at a piece of paper on their desk. One sheet, a printed version of the document. Two paragraphs of text with one handwritten correction. It takes them less than five minutes to retype it, all the time arguing that there should have been a backup. Think about this for a second though. If OP had gone straight to that person's desk, to find out what exactly the problem was and what they did to remove that file, they might have found that paper a lot earlier and never would have contacted anyone and never would have realized that there was a problem with the backups and that nothing was working properly. In this case, they got very lucky. They were able to find out about the backup problem in a way that didn't create huge problems other than having to retype two paragraphs. Check out all four OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.